Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the very first CXO panel for Nullcon 8-bit. Uh, the topic of discussion for today's, uh, the, the first CXO panel is the Digital Warriors, India and the Future of Conflict on the Internet. Uh, for this esteemed panel, our moderator is uh, Mr. Saikat Datta. He's a director of Center of Internet Security, and he's an award-winning journalist too. Uh, we have Sir Brijesh Datta. He's a CISO of Reliance Geo and an ex-Army officer. We have Dr. Uh, Muktesh Chandar. He's a director general of Goa State Police. And we have Dr. Anja Kovex. Uh, she's a founder director of Internet Democracy Project, and she's based out of Delhi. And we have uh, we have Commander Anand with us. Uh, I'll hand it over to Brijesh. Uh, I'll hand it over to Saikat to uh, drive rest of the discussion. Thank you, Himanshu. I guess we can't do anything about the ambient noise. So I guess you'll have to stress a little to hear what we are saying. But I'll quickly give introductions of who the people on the panel are. So you'll get a fair sense of what are the areas that they will cover and what their expertise really is in. So if I were to start from the lady on my right, her name is Dr. Anya Kovacs. She spent, she's the founder director of the Internet Democracy Project, and she has. This is what happens when techies get into. So she spent almost 14 years in India researching on issues of technology related to the internet as well as human rights, and has been participating in multi stakeholder meetings globally on internet governance as well as following up on issues of cyber security and cyber warfare from a human rights perspective because at the end of the day the legal architectures that are created are all centered around what kind of uh, restrictions you will have on cyber warfare or on issues of cyber security. And in fact if you go on to her website you will get to see some great work which has just come out on the issues of cyber security when it comes to women and they have just spent a lot of time traveling around northern India and putting together this research. So that's Anya Kovacs for you. Next to her is Dr. Muktesh Chandar. He is a very senior member of the Indian Police Service and brings nearly 30 years of solid law enforcement experience to this. But more than that, he's also uh, from the IIT Delhi and he has a PhD in cyber security and he was also associated with NTRO, NTRO which is the Indian uh, version of the National Security Agency. And there he looked at a lot of work on critical information infrastructure, basically finding and researching and implementing ways and means to protect critical information infrastructure, which as per Indian law is, is an area where any attack could lead to catastrophic consequences, not only for national security, but also for uh, Indian economic interests. Next to that is Commodore Anand. Commodore Anand is a serving naval uh, officer and he has been sent on deputation to take over what Dr. Muktesh Chandar at some point in his career was looking at and he is currently the additional director general of the National Critical Information Infrastructure Protection Center. NCIIPC was created from the Information Technology Act which was amended in 2008. So this is a legal entity which has been created specifically to look at any threat to critical information infrastructure. And today we have five or six sectors which uh, Commodore Anand will speak about. But before that he was also handling WESI, which is a naval uh, cyber security group which looks at not only offensive and defensive operations but also serves as the research backbone of the Indian Navy when it comes to cyber security. Hopefully we will be able to get some secrets out of Commodore Anand during the discussion. And the last person who's uh, at, the, at my extreme right is Colonel Brijesh Datta. And I don't think you will find many people with his expertise in the country today. He spent over 25 years not only in the army but also looking at telecom infrastructure and security. And he's from the Signals Directorate of the Indian Army and has, uh, is also an alumni of IIT Delhi where he's done a lot of work on cyber security. And the key thing, and, and 
bit of the legends that I've heard about Colonel Brijesh Dutta is that today, when when the Indian Army was still grappling with how to deal with cyber security, he would be uh, sort of in charge of people in army hierarchy, senior to him, and actually sitting and writing code and writing patches and taking care of things in real time. So that's the kind of expertise that Colonel Brijesh Dutta brings to the table and currently he is CISO of Reliance Geo, you know that same telecom network which in a matter of months has grabbed hold of some 100 million subscribers. So there's a lot of experience that you'll get to hear from Colonel Brijesh Dutta. He was also associated with Airtel, so you can see the kind of quality that he brings to the panel. And with that, we'll just quickly start off. I'll start off with uh, Dr. Muktesh Chandar. Basically because initially we wanted to understand the kind of legal architecture that we need to deal with issues of not only cyber security but also cyber warfare. Because every time there is an attack, a cyber attack, we need to understand that what kind of legal provisions are available to us to sort of take recourse to it and take help of the government. And more importantly also understand that in a post-incident uh, setup, what kind of work needs to be done which if you could throw some light on that, Dr. Chandra. Uh, thank you, Sakat. And, uh, maybe, maybe I think it is, it would be better. First of all, let us understand the protection regime which is there in India. Can people hear at the back? Can you hear at the back what Dr. Chandra is saying? I think I think it will be better if I use this. Hello. I think it will be better like this. Now, National Critical Information Infrastructure Protection Center. This became a legal entity when I was in NTRO, I was uh, heading this organization. And as per Section 70A of Information Technology Act, the organization and the notification was issued. After that, the rules under which NCIPC would function. They were also issued. We had submitted those while I was there in the organization. But after about few months later when I left, the notification came. So as of now, the legal framework for the protection regime is already there. Apart from that, Within India, the IT Act, the other other Indian Penal Code and all other things are existing. But when we talk of the international regime, we hardly have anything. First of all, the Cyber Crime International Treaty is still a dream. The Budapest Treaty is a regional arrangement of a sort and India is still not a signatory to that for various reasons. UN is st United Nations is st still struggling with that that when to have a cyber crime, international cyber crime and cooperation treaty. And before that could happen we are already into a cyber war regime. We already had several instances of so-called cyber war or cyber attacks. And as a result of that, already there is a NATO manual called Tallinn manual which has come into existence that what is cyber warfare, what retaliation, what preventive and deterrent actions are supposed to be taken if a country is under cyber attack and whether you can also retaliate in kinetic space in case you are attacked in cyberspace. So this is a largely a NATO arrangement 
the entire draft was drafted by by united uh, uh, states favoring them and only nato countries are following but they have already declared that if you do it to me like this uh, this is the way i am going to behave now there have been several international conferences where the norms of cyber behavior are being discussed i was i attended two of them in south korea and there has not been any consensus even on the word what is cyber terrorism so if we cannot define cyber terrorism what it means how can we have norms of conduct in cyber space by state or state sponsored actors when it comes to attack on critical information infrastructure or critical infrastructure i think already the fifth domain of warfare has come into existence there is no debate on that now the debate only is when are we going to have some kind of control on cyber weaponization some kind of non proliferation treaty like we have nuclear deterrence uh, the nuclear non proliferation treaty and in the absence of all these international mechanisms the only way i perceive and this is my personal opinion is that build your defenses and show your offensive capabilities the deterrence effect the deterrent effect of any country's capabilities to to get into that regime i think in, if i call it in hindi it's called dangal so to dangal mein utar do utro aur show your capabilities that you are capable of doing it if you do it to me i'll do it to you yes. and many countries have started adopting the same approach because there is no international mechanism there is no international definition yes. Yes. in fact yes. in that conference where the things were being debated there were several countries which have been allegedly involved into cyber weaponization and attacks so how can there be a consensus like that but attempts have been made the way forward as i said is protection regime and for which ncipc in india has already Uh, started the work we had issued guidelines for the protection of critical information infrastructure in india way back in 2013 and i am sure uh, the present additional director general of ncipc commander anand must be taking it forward but at the same time the the offensive capabilities many of which cannot be discussed in open forums like this must be strengthened and the way we declare to the world by nuclear detonation the purpose of detonation was only to tell the world that we have nuclear capabilities beware of doing anything like any misadventure we haven't done anything like that it's a policy decision it has lot of implications worldwide i'm sure some work is being done in this direction also and it is a matter of time when country takes a decision whether to declare to the world that yes we are also into it don't underestimate in the terms of cyber weaponization also the future is very uncertain it is evolving and i don't see for another 5 to 10 years anything in the international regime or mechanism the events coming will 
will shape the diplomatic dialogues and technical discussions in this direction. Various events are taking place, but 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 I think Anya would be able to throw some light on that uh, in the international direction policy making what is happening. It's a wait and watch situation, but at the same time country cannot as, as India we cannot wait and watch for things to evolve and then follow our approach. We must be ready with our approach of deterrence as well as protection. And incidentally, the center I was heading in in the, my organization, previous organization, NTRO, was CCDIA, Center for Cyber Deterrence and Information Assurance. And that word deterrence has a lot of meaning. So I leave it to you. It has both the elements, deterrence and information assurance. Information assurance is a larger word. It involves protection also. So the protection and deterrence element are already built into the regime which we have in NTRO and section 70A. Uh, I think the less said is better in this direction. Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll try to come back to you and ferret a few more secrets out of you on that. But uh, I would like to now request uh, Dr. Anya Kovacs to come in. Uh, some of the issues that I thought if you could handle. Uh, we are looking at different kinds of cyber warfare today. Like I just read something today morning where you you've looked at the kind of hacks in the American elections which have allegedly been carried out by Russian hackers. So here you have a case where a foreign country is actually deciding the elections of another country. But as far as my understanding goes, the Talin manual doesn't really carry or cover that as an aspect of cyber warfare. So if you could look at, and, and you also see different kinds of challenges today. So for example, today a non-state actor like the ISIS, the Islamic State or Daesh as we know it, is crossing boundaries thousands of kilometers away and radicalizing people from across the world, trying to egg them onto terror acts of terror like we saw in Bangladesh and like we are seeing in Afghanistan and India. So what is the current international jurisdiction and where, where are the gaps as far as you can see them? Thanks, Saikal. Thanks, Saikal. Um, what I will do basically, I think, is uh, supplement a lot of what Dr. Chowder had said. Obviously, coming at this from a slightly different perspective, and I think I'm both more slightly optimistic about the global process and slightly more cautious about some elements. Um, the first thing I want to point out is an issue of terminology. I think we have to be really careful when we use the word cyber warfare, and particularly the term war. And sometimes it troubles me quite a bit to see this being thrown around too casually in conferences like this. I agree totally that the threats that have come with cyberspace are massive, the challenges are new, it really changes things qualitatively as well, it's not just a quantitative measure. But why I want to have caution about actually using the term war is because war is a concept that's defined under international law. And under international law, something only becomes war under very specific conditions. Those conditions include the violation of sovereignty of a country, so interference in domestic affairs, and the use of force. When those conditions are in place and it becomes war, a country has the right to in turn use force as well. And I think that's why I want to sound caution. If you recognize something as war under international law, it actually allows for escalation in the sense that the use of force becomes legitimate. I think we need to be a bit more careful on the terminology because my assumption is that what we're all aiming for is de-escalation, not escalation, right? The idea is to build an ecosystem in which everybody has enough reason to lower offensive capacities and focus on defensive capacities, which is not the case at the moment. Um, as for the processes, so the challenge with cyber uh, space is of course that 
when is that threshold when something becomes war actually crossed is far less clear than it was before. And so a lot of the processes that are happening now internationally are in part focused on looking at when that happens. Um, there have actually been calls to have a treaty as early as 1998. Uh, 1990, yes, 1998. Um, driven by Russia, of all countries, which has been insisting continuously to have a treaty. That's again really interesting information, because if you look at the allegations about Russians' involvement in uh, uh, American politics, whether or not there is, like for them, them this is a win-win treaty, right? Because they can say we can do this because there is a gray area in law, and that gray area exists because we don't have a treaty. India actually also has been very supportive of a treaty, has mentioned this in many fora, including fora that, strictly speaking, are not about cybersecurity. What are some of the reasons why this isn't uh, moving forward very well? One I think people in this conference will be undoubtedly very familiar with is the whole issue of attribution. So this is coming to Seikert's point about non-state actors. Under international law, war is between states. If there is a non-state actor involved, strictly speaking, under the legal frame, it should come under cybercrime. But for a country like India, where terrorism is one of the big challenges, that issue is closely linked to the issue of cyber war, also because it's often states who sponsor those non-state actors. The thing is, if you can't attribute that pro properly, you get stuck. So does that mean you need to build one treaty for cybercrime and cybersecurity? Then you have even more issues on the plate, so that only further complicates things. So actors is one thing, uh, which actors you involve in the treaty, whether or the whole issue of attribution. And then the third one is part of the reason why the Russia idea never moves. Russia and some, uh, the, a lot of the Shanghai Cooperation countries want to have a treaty that actually addresses information security, which would also be about content. So then you come into the framework of human rights, which a lot of other countries, including India, have been quite keen to keep out of those discussions. So it's really, the problem is so massive. The issues are so linked. Now, how are you going to cut the pie? It's really difficult to start with one small thing, but we're just not ready to deal with this entire thing together. So the big processes that have been there so far are two in particular. One is within the UN itself. It's called the Governmental Group of Experts, started in 2004. They've had five rounds so far. Each one had between 15 and 25 participants, and India has been part of all of them except the fourth one. So we're currently on the fifth. Initially, they made very little progress. So the entire idea was that they would look at this question of when does it become war? Uh, does international law even apply? The breakthrough came in 2013, in the third round, when they decided, yes, international law applied. So until then, that very big question of whether all these other treaties actually come into place in the first place when it is about cyberspace wasn't even clear yet. Since then, they've made incremental steps. Process is tremendously slow. I can imagine that for people like Dr. Chandra have to deal with these issues on the ground, that's really frustrating. But what, why that UN process is important is because it is the UN. So after all, that agreement is signaling a, a consensus. This decision of that group was ratified by the General Assembly. So the movement that is made is a real gain, and that's, that's important. The second important process is the one Dr. Chandra already mentioned, the Tallinn Manual. And so this was started by the NATO, an exercise again to put a group of experts together, but those were NATO people. So countries like India weren't really involved in those debates in the first round. They also looked again at the question of when does it become a, a war, when not, what does that mean in cyberspace? Even the recommendations they came up with don't have full agreement always, so even those experts didn't always agree on how to move this forward. That exercise was still seen as important, though, because they really went into detail of the questions. And it was the first time that you actually have all of this documented. So in terms of moving the debate forward, it's an important reference point. 
Since then, they've started working, or they've uh, recently released, actually, early Feb, uh, a second version, which again kind of highlights the point that uh, one shouldn't only focus on war in that legal sense. Most of the challenges happen before what would be called war under the UN Charter. And so the second one looks at cyber peace operations and asks exactly the kind of questions that Saikot also mentioned. So about Russia's role in the election, so the Talent Manual doesn't have any uh, agreement. Uh, different experts have different opinions on that. Another issue they looked at, for example, is under international law, you can't uh, attack civilian objects as a government. That would be a war crime. So is data a civilian object or not? This one there was agreement on that it isn't, but some of the consequences of that there wasn't uh, agreement on, uh, on again. So I think we have to be realistic. Any treaty in the UN takes at least 10 years to negotiate. Something that is as fast changing as this field is at the moment will take even longer. All of these steps are really important small steps to build consensus. And I think it's really important and really welcome that India has been consistently part of every uh, step of that process, flags these issues in all of these uh, fora, and really pushes the concerns of developing countries in general, I think. Just one final thing, Saikad, if I may. I would really like to call on the government though to reach out to other actors, including civil society, including human rights organizations, more than it has been doing on cyber security also, not just on issues of free speech, etc., where we already have much more context. That global conference on cyberspace is coming up in, uh, in November this year. The last one was in the Netherlands. The Dutch government did make that effort, and I really hope that we will see the same push by the Indian government to get a lot of variety and actors there and a lot of people in this room as well. Yes. Thank you. I may also uh, quickly point out that thanks to Dr. Anya Kovacs, we are probably one of those few panels here which is not all men. So thanks to her, we have avoided becoming a manel. So thank you again. Uh, before, uh, I, when I come to Komodo Ranan, I'm hoping he'll also tell us what are Indian capabilities to shut out a nuclear facility in, say, Kahuta, Pakistan. But on the off chance that he doesn't discuss that, I would like to understand from him what are the technical challenges that you are facing when you are looking at protecting such large and massive sectors which have all been mandated critical. As far as my understanding goes, power and energy is one sector, transportation is another sector, your telecom and ITS is another sector and you have also something called government strategic uh, areas which are also considered critical. And a lot of this from what we gathered from Dr. Anya Kovacs is for example if let's say a uh, nation state wants to attack India and attack say the power sector, it will also have a bearing on civilian sectors like say the medical sector and so on and so forth. So what are the technical challenges from a network architecture or, or other issues that you're facing when, when you are trying to protect such a massive mandate given the resources that you have? Yeah, uh, thank you Saikat and good afternoon to all of you. I'm in a little bit of an unenvious uh, position here because I have a predecessor who actually launched the NCIPC and uh, his you know, wisdom and vision and uh, all the other apex level decisions that he took at that time has really uh, made this organization a possibility, NCIPC. So, uh, it's still a baby as far as organizations in the government of India are concerned because uh, as Dr. Muktesh brought out, it was in 2014, 6th of January to be precise that NCIPC was actually formed by a visit notification. So we recently completed our uh, third foundation day on 16th of January 2017. Uh, so coming to your question, Saikat, uh, uh, let me just uh, give you a brief uh, about what NCPC is all about. Uh, uh, at this point in time, our charter is to protect all the critical information infrastructure that we have in the country. When I say uh, all, it means uh, in, in the government, in the private sector, in the public sector and everything else that is considered critical. So uh, we have broken down into manageable chunks at this point in time uh, and as Saikat also brought out, uh, energy and power. It is 
possibly right up there because what we had done is that in order to figure out what is critical, we had done something known as an interdependency matrix. The interdependency matrix tells you which sector depends on which other sector or which sector is dependent on which other sector. So when we drew this matrix, we found that power has an effect on all the other critical information infrastructure in the country. The second uh, critical information infrastructure that we are handling is telecom. Because in today's day and age, uh, without telecom, we are all you know sort of uh, dead. Uh, a third one is the finance sector. And finance again, uh, most of your transactions, there's especially after the demonetization move, a lot of transactions have moved online. It is only going to increase. And not only uh, in India, but even globally, if you look at the way uh, transactions have been happening online, there is a year on year increase of about 12 to 15 percent. In developed countries, they are already saturated, so maybe the increases wouldn't be that high. But in a country like ours, I won't be surprised if next year, if you take a call, we'll find that maybe, you know, we have increased it by 25 to 30 percent. And this is year on year. The fourth sector that we are targeting is the transport sector. Uh, fundamentally, if you look at uh, the way the railways function, their signaling, or the air, airlines function, their ATC, the shipping, you know, their uh, uh, information uh, uh, resource management, the automated information systems, etc. These are all completely automated. The fifth sector is, of course, the government, because government uh, has become power users of IT now, both in the central government, the various ministries, as well as the state governments. And the last sector that we are targeting right now is what are known as strategic public enterprises. This include all those enterprises which are not covered in any of the other five sectors that I talked about. So industries like Bharat Electronics Limited, Bharat Heavy Electronics Limited, uh, National Thermal Power Corporation, and a lot of other strategic industries, ECIL, they all come under the strategic PSEs as we call it. Now this list of six is by no means comprehensive or exhaustive. And as all of you would imagine, it has to be dynamic. We have to take in more and more critical information sectors as and when uh, we, we realize that the interdependency that we are talking about starts moving up or creeping up. Health is another sector that we have recently started looking at because that is also critical from the viewpoint of you know uh, physical health and safety of uh, the citizens of India. So that is briefly what uh, we are doing. Now coming to the very focused uh, point that Saikat wanted uh, me to talk about what are the challenges, technological challenges specifically. The biggest challenge that we have is that the systems that are used in each of this critical information infrastructure are fundamentally bought out from foreign technologies. We have a lot of OEMs who are multinationals who have brought these technologies into our country. There are systems integrators in our country who have integrated diverse OEMs systems in uh, critical information infrastructure, stitched it together, customized it, tweaked it and made it operable in the context or in the environment that they need to operate. So number one is that. Now why is that a challenge? It is a challenge because we all know with information security or I ICT technologies as we call it, even the OEMs would have actually gone ahead and got this from COTS technologies and then retrofitted it. There are very few industries and I would possibly single out the military industry as uh, one of the agencies where a lot of pioneering uh, indigenous work happens because there the cost uh, you know the cost that you are going to in incur in terms of technologies going bad or not being able to cope up with the uh, pressures of a war are too high. Therefore if you look at uh, uh, foreign agencies like the DARPA in the US or even in our own country the DRDO there are some technologies which we need to do indigenously. For the rest it's all costs. So a large part of the CII industry when we look at it, we find that 80% uh, of the systems are essentially cords which have been customized to be made uh, operable in the environment that they went to. The problem with cords is that security is the last of the concerns. Cords essentially is driven by profit margins. It is essentially driven by the revenue that the company can generate and how fast you can be off your prototype board onto the production field. So this is the biggest challenge that we have because these technologies that we come in and we sort of subsume into our CII, uh, they are fundamentally uh, developed using COTS technologies and therefore you know, security is uh, uh, it's not too much of a concern. So how do we now address this? The uh, one way of looking at it is that 
if you don't have those technologies built in house and you get it from abroad or get it from other OEMs and uh, vendors, can you have the facility to test it in our company? When I say testing, I'm not talking of you know functionality testing or performance testing, which in any case the company which is hiring the services would do because that is their prime function. Their business process depends on a certain system being available all the time, 99.99% of time, etc. So performance test testing is done, functional verification is done. We do something known as factory exception test. You do know you know uh, something known as a site exception test. Everything is hunky dory. Have we tested it for security? Now the issue is that even the OEMs who would have designed the systems wouldn't possibly have been thorough in testing it out from a security perspective. The concept of security testing is, I would say, very nascent in the sense that if you look at some of the uh, international uh, criteria that you have known as the common criteria, which allows you to put a system under test, evaluate that, see to it if it is doing anything fishy or is it doing something. Yeah, so the biggest challenge with security testing is that you are actually trying to find out something that the device is doing which it is not expected to. So you don't even have a test vector for that. I know that when I push in a certain input for a radar let's say, I am supposed to get a certain output. It is going to paint me a picture of you know the aircrafts that are there or the ships that are there or whatever. Now apart from painting that picture to me on the radar screen, is the radar also painting it for somebody else? who is not supposed to be at the receiving end of this information. This is what security testing is all about. Unfortunately, as I said, security testing, because it is so nascent, it is prohibitively expensive and therefore it pushes up the cost of the products by orders of magnitude. And if you are in the business of generating revenues out of, uh, you know, uh, by, by being in competition with a couple of other players, then you would possibly give it the short shift. This is the biggest challenge that I foresee with respect to technology, adoption of technologies, imbibing and embedding them into the CI. I will also like to, uh, you know, use this opportunity because your your uh, uh, main theme says conflicts uh, of the future in the internet. I uh, I presume that that would possibly be coming up uh, as part of the uh, topic. So I just like to share with this uh, audience an interesting analogy which Dr. Muktesh also brought out about deterrence. So if you look at conventionally how do how do the military systems or the, how do the militaries of the world uh, project their power and deterrence is all about projecting power right. As Dr. Muktesh said that how do you project power in the cyber world. There are no clear cut mechanisms at this point in time. For militaries it's simple if I have let's say you know 50 uh, squadrons of jet fighters each of them with about 15 or 20 aircraft the whole world knows about it, you just have to look at uh, the Jane's Defense Weekly, it will tell you, okay fine, this country has got so much of prowess as far as fighter jet craft, uh, aircraft are concerned, this country has so much of prowess with respect to the destroyers and the frigates and the aircraft carriers that they have in the Navy and you know the uh, number of uh, uh, tank divisions it has, all those things are available in the Jane's Defense Weekly today or Jane's Defense uh, uh, publications. So the whole world knows about it. Here we have a community which is sort of just come out of the womb so to say and trying to find its baby steps. So there is no clear articulation of a policy of how do you project power in the cyber world. Carrying out a few uh, you know uh, attacks on certain systems, very difficult to find attribution, you don't know who's committed it in the first place because of the nitty gritty so the you know the protocols and the IP addressing scheme that we have in the world today, very difficult to attribute. So how do you project power in the cyber world? This is a question that we don't seem to have an answer as of now. A uh, lot of theoretical research is happening on it. A lot of uh, uh, academic research is happening on it. A lot of industries are working on it. A lot of ministries are working on it. But I don't know. We don't seem to have an answer. Another challenge with respect to this nascent domain, I still call it a nascent domain, is that it happens at the intersection of various uh, philosophies. Technology definitely is a big driver, it's a prime mover. But you also need a fair amount of multidisciplinary skills, for example, mathematics. You need skills in sociology. In fact, I, I was uh, amazed to know that one of my co-panelists here is an anthropologist or you said, yeah. So look at the way anthropology has seeped into cyber security and it's only going to increase. You will have uh, diverse fields coming in and sort of collaborating 
because uh, you really don't know in cyber security where is it going, where is the next uh, you know big thing going to happen. The more multidisciplinary skills you have, more uh, people with multidisciplinary skills come and uh, work together, you're going to have a world where uh, you're going to have innovations. So this is the challenge. We really don't know where we are going to stop, or should we stop, or we should get more and more people. For example, humanities. How do you get? How do I get the humanities guy to contribute to cyber security? Because social cyber security is a sociological problem as well. So two quick questions before I move to projection. Yeah. One is that when you talk about cyber projection, the Stuxnet was done. More or less, everybody accepts that the Americans and the Israelis worked together to introduce the Stuxnet virus. And they also let it be known to a lot of people that we were behind it and they have not really denied it formally because it was also a way of power projection, could that be one? And the second is considering the kind of audience that we have, you see most of them come from the private sector. Without a revenue model, it becomes very difficult for them to participate in some of this. So can you list out some of the areas that you would want help from them? So they can also build their revenue models and therefore participate in those technology challenges that you are facing to build those indigenous capabilities that you were talking about. Great. Uh, I'm happy that you brought this thing out and uh, I will answer the first question uh, in a typical uh, manner that an intelligence organization would answer. Uh, neither the US nor the Israel have either confirmed or denied that they were participant to this Stuxnet uh, creation. And that's typically what happens in this world, as I said. We don't have a clear-cut articulation of a policy of projecting cyber power. Number two, you, uh, you talked about how do you help out the private sector or the people who are in the business of generating these uh, various systems for cyber security play a part in such a way that uh, you know, these things become uh, easier. Uh, I'm not a marketing guy, but uh, having read a little bit about you know, uh, Phil Kotler's and the marketers of the world. Uh, the principal concept in marketing is how do you differentiate your product from that of your competitor? I think we need to look at the companies, the mature companies need to look at now security as a differentiator. Cost will always be a differentiator, functionalities will be there, but if you can project security, at if, let's say for example in a CII, in a power system or a gas agency we have somebody uh, you know, from uh, uh, the agency here, they were to buy a system for protection. Let's say a firewall or an IDS or an IPS or a UTM system. How do I project it if I were a Juniper or a Cisco or a Checkpoint? How do I project security as a key differentiator for a security technology? And I'm not even looking at, you know, security technology, even your operational systems and industrial control systems. If I have a differentiation whereby I say that, my system has been evaluated for security through the following models. It could be any model. It could be a, a you know a common criteria kind of a model or anything comparable. If I can make that stand out, I am sure the agencies who are worried about security would definitely look at that as one of the USPs of that uh, agency. Cost will definitely be there, but increasingly I see when we interact with the CII that more and more CISOs and CIOs are getting a look in into the board of directors. So we had some meeting uh, uh, about a week back uh, at uh, Air India and most of the time our meetings happen at the CISO level. I was actually uh, you know, uh, 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 pretty kicked up to see that the CEO or the CMD of Air India actually attended that meeting. There is a fair amount of awareness and sensitization that has happened right at the topmost level in the companies. So when the CIO or the CISO prescribes something and I think uh, Bridget will bear me out that it is taken as something that is now needs to be calculated or put into the calculus of the company's business process. So if you can look at differentiating security as one of your USPs and then the rest of the things can be done by the marketing team, I'm sure they'll be able to take it. Thank that you so I much. think would be my answer. So uh, I would li like to bring, I've been sort of saving the best for the last is uh, Brijesh. He's also been a colleague because I had worked with Reliance Industries for a bit and uh, He's easily one of the most respected people in the organization across various verticals. So what I would like to get from you is that since you've been in the government and now you've spent so much time in the private sector, the relationship between the government and the private sector is usually a little te full of tension because private sector always looks at the government as an auditor or as a regulator and has 
and obviously it has to do those functions. But cybersecurity is an area where you need a lot of trust, a lot of cooperation. So what are your perspectives now that you're handling such a huge behemoth of an organization like Geo? And what are the challenges that you face? And also if you could look at what are the sort of strengths that you can bring to the table and give it to the government of India so that both of you can work together and how can you build up those mechanisms? Um, thank you. Thanks, Sajjan. Uh, gentlemen, um, so I'm going to be a little more uh, particular about our country. I know there was some uh, brilliant, uh, you know, thoughts on how cybersecurity and cyber war affect the world. Right? I'm going to become a little closer home and uh, talk to realities because, fortunately, I've been uh, very closely involved in this, um, both as a you know protector, as a defender, and as an attacker. Both. So closer to home, you know, all of you realize that you know cyber attacks, cyber war, and I absolutely agree with Anya when I say cyber warfare is something which is overly hyped. So I'll not use that word anymore. It's all about motivations. You know, cyber attacks are only about motivations. So if let's take we want to kind of categorize of what is it that uh, the government should be doing, what is it that we as corporate should be doing, examine the motivation. So we have essentially two kind of attackers, all of you are aware. I know there's a brilliant audience here, I recognize some experts in the field here. There are state actors, broadly and non-state actors, right? Non-state actors, all of you know very well, so I'm not going to elaborate. These days, it's about only one thing, non-state actors attacking uh, any of us. Anybody? It's about money. 99% attacks are about money now. The ransom, the, the, what, what have you, right? So all of us know. Now, since it's about cash, how do we protect ourselves and what do we protect? <coughs> Earlier, it used to be different. We used to have activists out to kind of expose our data out in the open. <coughs> it was about privacy. Privacy seems to have somehow gone down. Why? Because our information is everywhere on the internet already. Right? A CD full of data, a lack records, sells for peanuts in the market these days with your privacy data. It's a known fact. Now it's about money. So now coming back to the topic. State actors, this is what this talk is about, right? What is it that a state actor actually wants from you? So I'm going to give you some insights into at least our part of the geography. You know, abroad, state actors are looking for different things. For example, this uh, Iran attack, Stuxnet, uh, trying to paralyze a nuclear plant. There are two kinds of things that state actors want to do, right? One is attack you, which is called a computer network attack. And one is exploitation, which is getting information out of you. That is called CNE, network exploitation. Network attack and exploitation. An attack is of two kinds. One is the erstwhile technique of paralyzing a network, right? Bringing your network down. And the other, which is now gaining ground and which in my opinion is going to be the biggest thing is about PSYOPs. Let me elaborate on the first, second part first, PSYOPs. Gentlemen, you are seeing it in action everywhere now. PSYOPs, PSYOPs through user of cyber war. When a state actor gets involved in PSYOPs, in the present generation of social media, it is disastrous. You can cause riots in a country, you can cause people to get killed in hundreds. And this is what you're going to see the next generation of cyber attacks all about. You're going to see manipulation of social media to call actual destruction and cause anarchy in a country. What can we do about it? Unfortunately, very little, unless you happen to be in either China or Saudi Arabia or Iran, where you have a nation state protecting your entire network. There is very little you can do to protect against social media attacks. And that is actually going to be the next level um, you know, of cyber attacks by state sponsors, which is not actually a war-like scenario, but it's going to be very, very effective. And the first thing I talked about attack was paralyzing a network. Gentlemen, this is almost never going to happen. You know why? There's a very simple reason. You can never sustain a cyber level attack. If I were to bring down something, for example, the success program, it's very short lived, right? And you know what is the impact? The power which is trying to bring down your network loses control of the network forever. And no government ever wants to do that. If a state sponsor is out to get your network, they will ensure that the control stays forever. For what reasons? 
that's the second part of the exercise for network exploitation it is all about intelligence acquisition now in the west you see it's more of mystic trade secrets also now we know so many stories coming out i don't have to tell you there are enough stories of uh, companies which have been grounded like for example there is a stock of nokia which lost because of uh, intelligence secrets getting leaked up closer home in our part of the world in south asia it's more about uh, intelligence uh, for movements of our forces right what are we up to what are the latest nuclear what are the various uh, arsenals we acquired what are the latest generation of weapons it is more targeted towards governments that's one and second targets are companies which support the government for development of for example armament right so therefore the second part is the one which goes on continuously throughout the world and in our part of the world primary targets in the west are of course companies which develop munitions in our part of the world it is only governments and companies which directly support the governments so what is it that let's take the corporates can do about it you primarily should be focusing on protecting yourself against non state actors for now right in case unless you directly happen to be supporting something that the government is doing which means the usual plethora of security controls that are needed to secure your perimeter your data the works to prevent revenue losses for instance and the second part you know why state actors attack uh, corporate networks it is not to get to you it is to get to the your customers for that point there are two things that a government will you use your networks for number one would be to use your hardware and your servers as processing power you are just a raw processing power for the government if i were to acquire 100 of your servers i can do anything i want through them and you will not get to know you know why your systems are going to be kept clean and i'm telling you actual facts that your systems will be made sanitized so that you don't get attacked and the state still remains in control to launch attacks wherever needed on others that is one use case the second use case where corporate networks are used right is uh, of the in the critical infrastructure commodore anand was just talking about and there it is basically to get into your customers networks and telcos primary targets one of them others are also there but these are the ones so that's my two bit about it and um, sorry i have not addressed your question directly i think so i just second. i just for example jio today in a very complex world in a complex world jio today is not only a telecom company but it's also a technology company and it's also a payments bank so it's becoming increasingly complex so when you are sitting in the middle of such a complex network what are your expectations from the government what do you want from the government as a corporate entity um you know ideally ideally you know like i would love it in case the government could give me intelligence feeds of who are the attackers ideally right unfortunately that's a really really complex task and uh, you know i have i you know we have been trying quite hard to get hold of um, state actors lists where are the attackers right this is something which is very disconnected throughout the world every every different company has its own intelligence feeds You know, so, for example, so one is intelligence. What else right. do you need? Um, what about regulation? See, regulation. Unfortunately, like Anya is heading this about international cooperation with other governments. I don't know how effective this is, especially against a state, uh, a state-sponsored attack. So, of course, in an ideal world, I would expect, let's take, if some enemy country were to be launching an attack to me, something gets done about it, right? But I think that would be a pipe dream at this point of time. i don't know anya may be able to clarify better if it's really getting effective right one is one reason why it's not very effective is attributability you just said that right you it's almost near impossible to give an attribution and no state government generally launches a attack directly from the systems ever there are many different ways to do it you all know right and you will find an attack coming in from your own systems or your neighbor systems Right. So it's really, really difficult because of the complexity of an actual attack. So in a situation like that, can you offer something as a partner to the government where your capabilities can be used by the government? Absolutely, sir. Okay. That's an area in which the government can gain a lot uh, from not not my company, not Jio directly, but from competitors 
in this hall itself we have some experts of the world sitting here in fact i'm going to introduce uh, you to some of them after this one is sitting right here um we have some top experts of the world right uh brilliant guys who can assist the government in actually getting this thing right securing the government networks right um and how do these attacks happen and testing for instance right so yes the corporate sector has got tremendous experience in handling attacks from non state actors and essentially the attacks are the same the technology is the same the attack types are the same so therefore the defensive mechanisms are also the same so before i throw open the floor to all of you for questions one last question to dr muktesh chandra usually so if if in, in, even in a cyber warfare scenario the first indications will be felt by disjointed groups of people let's say civilians who are dealing with certain technology and suddenly they bear the brunt when the first indications of such an attack comes and usually the first port of call is the local police or the cyber stations of those local police so as somebody with decades of experience in law enforcement if you could tell us a what is the current capability of our law enforcement agencies and what are the things that they need to work on to build up certain capabilities where not only will they be able to investigate these kind of incidents but will also be able to analyze this as real time intelligence and pass it on to organizations like ncirp so i anticipated this uh, question first of all any any cyber crime any cyber attack is also a cyber crime as per information technology act a nfir is supposed to be registered investigated and the perpetrators should be arrested brought to before the law this mandate is with exclusively with police but officially if you see how many cyber crimes were registered in india in 2015 about 8000 just 8000 but if you see the dimension of what's happening in indian cyber space certain handled about 49000 cases cyber incident cases if not each one of them many would qualify as cyber crime fit for registration of cases we have about 91 lakh bot infected systems officially on record tracked by certain 26000 indian websites were hacked in 2015 itself so if all of them are supposed to be cyber crimes and should have been registered it's it's mind boggling it's mind boggling and the capability of indian police in handling cyber crime i would say lot of efforts have been made particularly in in cities like delhi bangalore pune mumbai but rest of the places a lot needs to be done and this capacity building is by and large again in the hands of certain other organizations for example uh, nascom has been doing a lot that a security council its branch is doing i would say a lot needs to be done in this direction particularly being in this field and also as a police officer i would say that i am not satisfied at all there may be many in the government would say yes, we have done sufficiently well in this field any particular area sir like digital forensics or any which are the areas of everything, expertise everything i think i think forensics the the central forensic science laboratory if you send one cell phone or one hard disk it comes after one and a half year or two years by the time the entire investigation is wound up the value of the evidence is lost if there is a case i need that information immediately so that i can arrest others i can find out the network i can i can i i proceed with my investigation if the report is supposed to come after one and a half year or two years the report is of no value to me one thing which brijesh was mentioning and you had also raised 
I would like to remind this audience of a cyber bounty program on in Nalcon few years back, in which a malware was detected. The malware was given to everybody, and then, with the help of some intelligence organization, we were able to track the command and control server, and that server was brought down with the help of companies like you and experts like you. That was a sort of surgical strike in that particular direction. It went unannounced. It, didn't, it was not reported so well in media also. But those who have been attending the Nalcon, they would know about it. So that's where they can contribute a lot. But not, not in their individual way, but associating themselves with some agency, responsible agency, in a responsible way. Thank you, sir. I have a lot of questions, but since we are running out of time, maybe a couple of questions from the audience and please direct it to somebody in particular so that that person can respond and then we'll wind up. Any questions? Yeah. And if you could please identify yourself. Yeah, myself Nilesh, hello everyone. Uh, I, head the service I head the service delivery for a company called Continuum uh, for India operation. So my question is uh, uh, to sir, it's more in line with the Indian education side. Uh, most of the universities, when you talk about the European universities or state universities, they are hosting or going very public in terms of hosting their infrastructure in a public domain. Uh, I mean, they're moving from on-prem to the public side, uh, the public cloud side. Uh, but what about Indian system? I mean, I hardly find any of the Indian educational, the bigger universities are are, are catering the services end to end uh, by adopting the cloud model. So is there a security uh, issues which I don't think or there's something related to governance from the, uh, I mean, you know, from the country perspective. So what is your view on that? I, I couldn't understand your question. Universities going public or on the net or no, what, what is it? So most of the university, when it comes to the end to end student administration process, uh, if you see a lot of universities in Australia, when you talk about the, you got it, right? Let me tell you, in IIT Delhi, from where I graduated, uh, uh, my, did my PhD, everything is electronic. Everything, even your registration, your marks, and if you miss that deadline, I, I think the system administrator won't be able to help you. So every, my problem was that most of the times I was posted outside Delhi, and I was a part-time PhD student. So in order to do my registration online, because everything has to be online, the fee has to be online, and you miss that registration, then you can't appear in the next uh, program. So, but there are, and every event of the entire IIT Delhi is announced online that this will happen on this date, this will happen on this date. There are universities which don't even know when the convocation will take place, when the admissions will start, because they have been doing everything manually. So, so a lot of universities are adopting this model where, where if I got your questions correctly. Partially, what I am saying that digitization is happening, automations are happening, computerization is happening for the Indian universities. I am talking about taking the entire data to the cloud environment. What is the uh, so, so the universities in India and universities out of India, I see huge difference from usability perspective of the technology. So that's my question. Maybe we can take this off. Yeah, we sir. probably can take this Any off. Any other question? Any other question? Yeah. Good afternoon, I'm Dinesh Bareja. Uh, my question is about, uh, you know... Uh, can you speak into the... Yeah. Uh, please. Commander, you mentioned that... Uh, Indian companies or companies should have security as a differentiator. Now, this is what you said primarily was talking about the big guys. There are a lot of small guys over here, there are a lot of small guys outside also. Both in terms of people who are making products and people who are providing services. There is nothing in the NCIPC from what I know or from other departments where there is no sort of support ecosystem for a small manufacturer, a small product maker or a small guy who has a brilliant idea or is, or is an expert in your services so maybe a reliance can stand okay they would get the tender they would get the rfp 
not that small kiddo. That's A. The second thing is this, that RFPs which are put out usually quote analyst firms that your product should be in the leader's quadrant and you know what I'm talking about. In spite of the fact that you're not supposed to talk about product by name or such private individuals or private analysts as a benchmark. Okay, so uh, your second question first. Uh, I, I think uh, it, this what you're talking about uh, might be happening. I'm not sure about it. But uh, the fundamental idea is that when you issue an RFP, it should not be company specific. It shouldn't be. There are times when uh, a due diligence is carried out by an organization who wants to procure a certain product, especially if it's a security product. And as part of the due diligence, there is a fair amount of benchmarking that is done of competing products. And then when you realize that uh, a certain product is what fits the bill, so to say, in the context in which you are going to operate, these kind of instances might come out where in the RFP you may mention a model or a specification, uh, you know, particular to a company or an OE. But by and large, it doesn't happen. And if it happens, then let me assure you that there is a due diligence that is carried out by the organization to do that. Yeah, so uh, I can see you shaking, uh, you know, a no. Uh, but I'm just telling you from the perspective that uh, we have been dealing with it. Your first question, yes, I don't seem to have an answer at this point in time. Because security testing is expensive. And uh, the big companies, as you rightly said, would build in their infrastructure embed that into the cost of the product and will possibly, you know, uh, we still be able to compete with the other biggies out there. As regards the smaller companies are concerned, what we could do is, and this is a thought process uh, that is, you know, sort of uh, 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 germinating in, in, in my organization as well. Uh, okay, let me just uh, give you this input uh, which is fairly new. Uh, NCIPC has incidentally also been tasked to do uh, and uh, to be an organization which can do security testing of products. When I say security testing, I'm not talking of the cryptology part of it. I'm talking of the cyber security, information security part of it. But because for cryptology, we already have an organization within the country. Uh, so that is a mandate uh, that uh, has been entrusted to us, and we are in the process of uh, taking it in two stages. We have finalized uh, that we first start with software testing, uh, the security testing of the software part and then gradually move to the hardware and you know the physical part of the system itself. But uh, to answer your question, uh, I think we would be fairly amenable to help these small companies devise certain test vectors which would be uh, good enough, let's say, for an organization like NCIPC for its deployment in the organization. And I'm sure once uh, this process starts off in one organization, it can be shared with the other organizations as well and possibly be taken up uh, on a national scale. Thank you, sir. Uh, sorry, it's really, really sorry to interrupt. Uh, we'll have to wrap up. So, uh, i just quickly wrap up what we have discussed and maybe taking off from the question that you asked, maybe somebody like Brajesh, uh, the kind of work that Geo is doing, at some later stage, Geo might be in a position to also start looking at some of the smaller players who are coming up with these technologies and look at them from an investment perspective but also see how they can indigenously help because there are some parts of Reliance Industries which is helping germinate new new technologies etc. Uh, I was very curious to ask Dr. Anya Kovacs about how India is doing in the international uh, space as far as negotiations on cyber warfare is concerned but I think we've run out of time. I've been very lucky to be sort of associated with at least three panelists formally with Brijesh because we were colleagues together in the same organization with the organization that Komodar Anand represents through the through an MOU and with Dr. Anya Kovacs because a lot of discussions that we had on cyber security and cyber warfare, she actually commissioned some of those studies and she's a terrific editor so we produced a lot of that work which is now available online and we have some hard copies. And incidentally the bots or the malware that uh, Dr. Muktesh Chandar is talking about, I am the person who had actually supplied that malware because it had first come to me, so it all comes together. But thank you for being here and, and you've been a wonderful audience. And I want to thank each one of my panelists. I mean, it was a privilege to have such distinguished people. And I really feel great to have all of you here. So thank you once again. Uh, big round of applause, guys. Thanks, thanks a lot. This was a wonderful panel.